You're listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible is Literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos, and you are listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible as Literature podcast. In today's program, Father Paul returns to his general commentary on the book of Genesis with a discussion of the literary hinge or turning point at the end of Genesis chapter 11, which serves as a jumping off point to the so-called scriptural story of Abraham. I am happy to introduce Father Paul on the Bible as Literature podcast, Tarazi Tuesdays. You know, the last verses of chapter 11, which introduce the Toledot of Terah, the father of Abram. Remember, I mentioned last time that Abram or Abraham and Joseph do not have Toledots, and that's important per se. And the beginning of chapter 12, we'll see the call of Abram, as usually it is called. In the Toledot of Terah, I began to touch on it last time, we have three children, one of whom dies in Ur of the Chaldeans. That's very important. The first mention of Ur of the Chaldeans in the Bible is in reference to the death of Haran, and we talked about him last time. And then they left Ur of the Chaldeans. But I would like to go over some of the names which are important. Nehor or Nahor in Hebrew is interesting in that the father of Terah is called Nehor, and then Terah calls his second son Nehor. That is important. In other words, it is as though Terah was looking ahead to the continuation of his progeny through Nehor. And it is obvious from the following text, because we hear that Haran died, the wife of Abram was barren, and Nahor had a son, Lot. But then again, the play on the names is very important here. I mentioned that Terah is a tricky name because it means sadness, that something somehow is going to be wrong. And this is found in these verses, the end of 11, that in my eyes function as a hinge, very important hinge, the way the last two verses of chapter 4 regarding the birth of Seth two verses, and the first verses of chapter 6, which is the end of the Toledot of Adam and the ire of God and his decision to eradicate his creation. Very important, and we took our time. And here also we have a turning, a hinge. We are really entering into the so-called scriptural story technically, with Abram. But let me go through the names and explain what I mean by the importance and the functionality of the names here. We talked about Haran. Let's revisit Nahor. First thing, he is mentioned for the second time as name. Number two, all three names are very powerful high, positive. Abram means the great father, the powerful father. Nahor is the snorting, and the snorting in the Bible is connected mainly with the horses, and later I shall read you a few passages from Psalms regarding the horses, the power of the king. And so you remember how later we have the mention of Solomon and so many chariots and horses. Very important. And Haran, again, the mountaineer. But let's zero in on Nahor. In verse 29, we hear, And Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai. Again, Sarai means my princes, 
princess, the plural of prince, and thus her name is again a reflection of greatness and powers that she would have many sons. And later, as we know, both Abram and Sarai, when God launched his covenant with them and told them that they would be the father of many nations and the mother of many nations in 17, they are aggrandized in the story that something is going to happen through them. But as usual in scripture, we have the belittling through the name. Abram becomes Abraham, the father of the sickling lamb. And Sarah means princess, meaning still not married or even if married, she's still without children. With Nahor, we have something similar here. He marries his niece. Notice how we have, in a way, a preparation of the story of his son, Lot, with his two daughters. And once you hear that, you realize that this Terah is very important. It's a sad story, beginning with Abram, as we shall see. His first step after he arrives in Canaan is to go down to Egypt during a famine. It's a sad story. People are not behaving according to the plan of God, but as usual, and I repeatedly said that, God brings his plan to an end, as Paul says at the beginning of Philippians. Most of the time, if not all of the time, in spite of the people. Now, Nehor marries his niece and his brother had two nieces, Milka and Iska. In the Hebrew, Milka, obviously everybody would have guessed that it is based on the three letters of Melik. Actually, the queen is called Malka in Hebrew. Now, the other one reflects Something very interesting because the root of the name is from Sak Saka. Just to make a long story short and go quickly, people have heard definitely about the Sukkot, the Feast of Sukkot, which is the tents, the tabernacle, and thus it is reflective of shepherd life. Okay, so we have Milka and Yiska. So the yod is non-functional here because when you conjugate, you add it in the verb of the imperfect. And you remain with the sak, sok, sukot. And I believe that that is the intention of the author. Otherwise, why would the author mention that the daughter, he married Milka, the daughter of Heran, the father of Milka and Iska? So the addition of Iska here is very important. And my hearing of the text is that precisely Nehor opted, I'm going to coin my own words as I do very often, for the snorting of the horse over the snorting of the sheep, if I may put it this way. And let me take an aside to show you how this is important I'm going to read quickly, just for the hearing, passages from Psalms. In Job we hear, Do you give the horse his might? Do you clothe his neck with strength? Do you make him leap like the locust? His majestic snorting is terrible. In Jeremiah we hear, They have healed the wound of my people lightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. And then we have a movement towards the attackers. We looked for peace, but no good came for a time of healing. But behold, terror, the snorting of their horses is heard from Dan. Remember, Dan is the northern part of the earth of the promise. And the sound of the neighing of their stallions, the whole land quakes. They come and devour the land. And so, so the horse is reflective, obviously, of this power. 
I'm going to move to Psalms, and we hear, A king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. And then we have suddenly, The war horse is a vain hope for victory, and by its great might it cannot save. Another passage very quickly about God. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the legs of a man, but the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast love. And the following verses speak about the fear of the Lord and the submission to his will. And I would like to end with this beautiful psalm. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved but abides forever. As the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so the Lord is round about his people. Very interesting. And this is, as I explained in another podcast, the function of the shepherd. He encompasses his flock. The following verse, For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest upon the land allotted to the righteous, lest the righteous put forth their hands to do wrong. Scepter is obviously connected with the king. And we have in this psalm again this play between the shebet and the scepter also of the king, the staff. Taking all this into consideration, obviously I'm appealing to the entire Bible, but this is how ultimately one understands the Bible. One first has to hear it in its totality, and I have said this a zillion times, and slowly on the interconnections are made. So the text is there. Now whether the hearer immediately captures the intention of the author in Genesis 11:29 or not is immaterial <laughs> because the material ultimately is that at one point some of the hearers will get it and would share it with the others so that is again to my is very important because it sets the tone to the story. Something is going wrong with these powerful names. And this will prepare the move to the beginning of chapter 12. But let's finish here with the last verses. Terah took Abram his son and Lot the son of Haran his grandson and Sarai his daughter-in-law his sons Abram's wife. And they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. Obviously, RSV has but when they came to Haran. The Hebrew does not have but. And when they came to Haran, they settled there. And this is a very clear sign that they are already in the land allocated by God, which is the Syrian desert. Later we shall hear that Isaac had to go there to get married. Jacob had to go there to get married. In Ezekiel we hear that my father was an Aramean, and all this is very important, and my mother a Hittite, and so on. But then the author wants to take us away from the desert towards the sea, where you have the closeness to Egypt and the rise of the two kingdoms and the kings, which was the beginning of the end, the beginning of God's being uneasy and preparing his punishment. So we have Haran that is mentioned, is very important. And then we move to the passage the beginning of chapter 12 where we hear about the beginning of the fate of Abraham. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network. 